So 11 behaviours of high performing teams, it's something, as I said, my whole career was in, in football as a player and then as a manager, and it's something I've recently put down in a document and feel uh, that these behaviours are essential. The, the picture that I've started with, is actually, I think all coaches here will, will know that to, to be a top coach, then you need to be able to be a thief at times. And this is actually a picture that was on Sir Alex Ferguson's uh, coaching office uh, at the training ground at Man United. And I think it's a fantastic picture to show uh, what a team is. There's 11 workers there in the, the Rockefeller Centre on the 69th floor having their lunch. I think the picture was set up, but it shows the camaraderie, uh, the togetherness, the, the spirit, the trust that you need uh, to be a team. And obviously the people that built that were, were a high performing team. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today and how you need that in football. My beliefs have been formed uh, as a child really from my parents throughout my football career with the, the coaches, the players I worked with, and then into my new career as a manager and a leader. I think you're always learning uh, different things and you're always uh, adapting and changing as you grow. So these beliefs have, have came over a number of years. I set them out in a team, I think 11 uh, obviously fits football. I've set them out in a team. I've had a few people ask me about this and no way is that my favorite shape, although I do like playing 4-3-3. Uh, and in no way is any one more important than the other in my opinion. I think they are all important at different times and they all must take uh, the same in terms of how much you put into them and what you try and achieve for your team. So, for instance, effort is no more important than resilience, uh, and, it, and it just goes throughout the team like that. How you apply these principles is the main thing. I think a lot of you will have seen these words or words related to this uh, before, but it's how you apply these, how you use these on a daily basis that I think really affects the team and ultimately the team have to act out these behaviours because just putting words on a page isn't enough. You have to get the point across, as you'll see throughout my presentation, you've seen at the start, imagery is important, storytelling is important and you have to get people within the team to buy into these and to apply these on a daily basis. The first one, effort. I think everything for me starts with hard work. If you aren't willing to work hard, if you aren't to work, willing to work for each other, then to achieve success is very, very difficult in life. How can we inspire people to work hard and to get more out of people? That is one of the great challenges, I think, for coaches uh, or for leaders in any sport or any business. A man that I worked with at Scotland spoke to me when I was uh, with the national team about daily standards and creating a competitive environment. And he used to play head tennis with staff, with players. And he said it was a great uh, kind of learner or eye-opener for him to see what players were competitive, what players wanted to work. Now that just doesn't have to be in a head tennis situation. That can be in a small-sided game. It can be a quiz at night. But I think it's very important that you set different things that allow people to show their competitive streak, that allow people to show how much effort they're willing to put in to win. Because without effort, like I said, achieving success is very, very difficult. Another fantastic coach I worked with was Gordon Strachan. And he, I was 25, I think, when I went to Celtic, and he changed my mentality and my physicality as a football player and that was a you know the big thing that you need to be conditioned to play at the highest level and that's again applies in any business or, or different sports you need to be conditioned to do the job at 100 percent he was a big his big thing in pre-season was what he called character days and i'm sure all the players if there's any on or players that worked with them will remember these with dread they were not to test you physically, they were to test you mentally, but it was a physical drill that he used to do it. And he would push you and push you to your very limits. And again, he didn't want to see who the fittest player in the team was. He wanted to see who was going to give the most effort. He wanted to see who was mentally going to 
stop and, and show that weakness that, that he couldn't have in his team. So he was a big believer in physical and mentally being 100% committed uh, to doing your very best for, for the team around you. And the biggest thing for me, effort, hard work, intensity, to, to have more than the opposition, it's not a talent. It's not a talent to, give, to, to kind of work hard, to give your best. It's something that, that you need to ingrain in people. And I think, like I said, that starts from your standards daily and throughout your, your workplace uh, every day. Accountability. Be accountable for your actions and make your teammates accountable for theirs. I think in football, everyone knows their job. Giving players ownership now is, is becoming more and more uh, in, into the game. And I think you have to do that. How you do that has to be, for me, uh, uh, almost you have to co-create. So you have to give, give the player you know, some ownership of what he needs to do. You obviously have to guide him in that and, and your plan of how you want to achieve that. But then once he gets that ownership, he then becomes accountable for his, his actions. And it's not a, a dictator type leader who is just telling players what to do all the time. I don't think that will work in the modern era. I think nowadays it has to be uh, a, a, an ownership that you give on players and then they focus that into their job. I think recently we've all watched The Last Dance and this was where I, I originally put this idea on, on LinkedIn and, and Sean seen it. I was fascinated by the, the team spirit that they had, the, the work ethic they had through the team, and also obviously the leader of that team, Michael Jordan, the demands that he placed on each other. For me, I put with respect because I believe that that has to be done in the right spirit and with, with respect to your teammates. Michael Jordan probably went over the line at times for the right reasons because he wanted to win so badly. Uh, but I believe placing these demands on each other can be done uh, with the respect and it, and it can make people better than they are. So every day you have to try and improve your teammates as much as you can. Nothing is personal within a team environment. And that is key to achieving the, the type of culture that I want to create within a, a team environment. I was recently at the Red Arrows. I spent the day there with the LMA and was blown away by the the accountability that they had, blown away by the honesty that they had and the, the, the drills that they did. I mean, as you can see there, they, they literally fly feet from each other at, at hundreds of miles an hour. And if they get it wrong, they're dead. We watched a training drill and after they came in to the, the meeting room, they, they analysed the training drill straight away. Every member of the team that made a mistake before they made the mistake was, was identifying it to his, to his team members before it happened. And then they were then discussing it and what they would do better next time. And the level of accountability was phenomenal for me. But the biggest thing that I took from it that I wanted to kind of pass on and, and think that, that it would work in other team environments was they didn't use any names in, in the meeting room. So when you made the mistake, the, the plane at the front was called R1 and then they went right back to R9. So every time they spoke to each other, they called each other by whatever plane they were in. So R1, R2, up to, up to R9. And that for me took the, the personal uh, approach out of, of giving uh, some feedback. Normally when you're in a meeting room, you say a name, it becomes a little bit personal. I think that to me was a real insight that you can take the, the personal or the, the feeling of it being too personal to individuals when you're given some criticism and, and that allows that accountability to be for the whole team and, and uh, really showed me that you can really achieve that without, without naming names so much. Winning isn't everything but the will to win is. This is maybe a, a contentious one for some people out there but <laughs> I believe that, that winning is the most important thing. Without a doubt, everyone is in sport, is in life to, to, to win. But focusing on that, I think, is detrimental to the development of the team, to the performance of the team. Just to win the next game at any cost is 
yes, we, we want to win the next game, but focusing everything on that, I think, creates anxiety and creates different things that puts players in a, in a more difficult position than we want them to be. Everyone wants to win, but it can't always happen. And I put this picture up. This is a cup final, uh, the first cup final I was involved in as a player for Hibernian in 2004. And we lost the game that we were expected to win against uh, Livingston. And I remember as the, the Livingston team went up to get the cup, some of the players and staff from, from the, the team went in and didn't watch them lift, lifting the cup. But I stayed out to, to watch them lift it because that feeling... Uh, that you have when you lose a game, when you lose a big game, like a cup final, really was, you know, it hurt me. It, it was really deep, uh, the, the pain that I had that day. And I think using losing as a motivation is a big thing uh, to use this within the, the team uh, principles and, and, and the behaviours that I Like I said, winning, focusing on winning, winning and, and making that the be all and end all, I think places a lot of anxiety on players and, and takes away from performance. Having the will to win is having the, the desire. It's a want. It's something that, that is in your mental approach rather than the outcome, which we will talk about later. This also allows players, people, to embrace challenges with a winner's mindset. So. Again, the focus on the will makes it more in, in your mental approach and allows you to embrace challenges. If you then lose a game, you can analyse, you can make adjustments and you can then change it. If your focus is solely on winning and you lose it, then I don't believe that you have a place to go to improve, to develop, to help you achieve that winning feeling that we all want. This is the one I actually put up on, on LinkedIn. The team come first. Play your role. This for me is, is, a, is a huge one. And I've, I've been very fortunate uh, to be a part of successful teams uh, over the years. As a player with Celtic, with Scotland there when we played France. And uh, as a manager with Wigan in 2006 winning League One. All of these teams have this, th these behaviours and attributes that I'm speaking about that, that give them that opportunity to have success. They all have characters in the team who would do anything to, to get that success to win, whether they're playing or not. And I think that is vital that you have that. All of these teams, the, the, the people in them, I look at that Scotland team that, you know, the, the level of player, the, the levels that each player played at in terms of Scotland Caps, in terms of Premier Leagues, their actions were always for the good of the team. When you went away with your international team, you were obviously playing for your club regularly and sometimes you wouldn't play for your, your international team. And everyone within that picture, within the squad that day, their actions always for, were for the good of the team. So there was no sulking, there was no energy sappers within the team. I'm a big believer that you need to be an energizer. You need to come in every day and make people better by your actions and your body language, your enthusiasm. Everyone has that role to play and you need to know what yours is and play it to the best of your ability to allow the success to happen. In terms of leadership and how you coach that until you get the best out of people. I think we all know and have had Mavericks in the past and these teams all had Mavericks in them. How you deal with them is, is huge and how the, the team evolves and how the team goes on to win. And I think the last time I showed you Dennis Rodman as a, as a Maverick type character. Managing those Mavericks and allowing them to, to be themselves within the team environment is is really a judgment call on coaches uh, at different levels, at different places, at different times. And you have to manage those mavericks to allow the, them to fit into this team ethic without overstep, allowing them to, to overstep the mark. Process focused. This is, for me, a massive one. I think every, every football team I've been at in terms of the supporters, in terms of 
the, the boards are, are, are very much outcome focused. It is a game where results really kind of drive everything. And like I said at the beginning, winning is the be all and end all. That is what we all want to achieve. But in terms of the behaviours we want, we have to prepare properly. We have to prepare for winning every week. Whether that happens or not, some things is, without our, is out with our control. And we have to then analyse and prepare again for the following week. So the focus is always on the process of how we approach the game. I believe this makes better decision makers and better game understanding to the people within your, your organisation. So rather than just again focusing on winning, focusing on the outcome, focusing on how we're going to get there, the little steps we need to take to improve to get there, I think develops better people in the long run. And that analyse with honesty, again back to the red arrows, this is a, a, a process that, that has to be done, whether you win or lose, it has to be done. This analysis allows you to be process focused, so quite often I've been involved with teams as a player that you'd win a game, no analysis, lose a game, big focus on analysis and what went wrong. I'm a big believer in when we win, let's analyse what went right, let's analyse the little things that we can improve. When we lose, let's analyse what we can improve to win, but let's analyse the little things we've maybe done right within the game. So it helps develop that responsibility and accountability throughout the team to then go and achieve winning performances and winning results. Always protect each other. Band of Brothers, obviously the picture in the background really highlights that. Band of Brothers and that empathy that each person has for each other. I think empathy for me as a player was a word that I, anyone who played with me probably didn't even know I, I knew what the word meant because I didn't really show much empathy as a player. And as I've got older, I think I've developed that and, and, and used that more now as, as a coach. But it's a massive, massive thing in the team. You have to have empathy throughout the team. How do you get that within the team? I think you have to allow people to have a voice. You have to be someone that opens up meetings, opens up uh, the, the floor in terms of you want people to speak, you want people to show their feelings, and you want people to understand each other better. Like I said about imagery and, and storytelling, togetherness, how do you create that? How do you get people to buy into this culture that you're trying to create of everyone together, everyone in it, fighting for each other? Two stories here. The one on the left is the V formation flying birds. Again, it's a, a Sir Alex Ferguson story that he told to the Ryder Cup team at Glen Eagles about how each bird takes their turn at the front and helps the bird behind by, by taking uh, the, some of the strain off them in terms of flying when they're flying long distances. And that togetherness, that work ethic of helping each other uh, is massive with, within a team. And using these types of stories to help get points across to a team, I think, is invaluable for players to uh, imagine what, what it looks like and, and they can uh, always kind of use that as an analogy to, to fall back on. The wolf pack, again, similar theme that wolves hunt together, they hunt in a pack, and they always look after each other. And, and they have this togetherness in, in large groups where they go hunting together and never leave wolves on their own. And again, that imagery will be massive in, in helping the players and the people within organisations to, to come together and, and to stick together through thick and thin. The sacrifice. How do you sacrifice for each other? It's, it's giving your all every day and doing anything to protect each other on and off the field. Creating this is something you can do on the pitch and off the pitch by putting different peoples in different teams so you're not always putting the same teams together. You're, you're breaking people up, making people work in different teams, whether it be bigger teams, smaller teams, and you're seeing how each individual within your group reacts, uh, working in in smaller environments or bigger environments with each other and how they sacrifice and help each other uh, throughout those, those drills. 
adhere to the culture of the club. This is something I can relate to with my management jobs. Uh, one went well, two, two not so well. At Wigan, I got the job from, from a playing role, and that was easier in a sense that I understood the club, I understood the values, I understood the history of the club, and that made it easier for me to associate with the supporters, to the players, and, and everyone within the organisation to, to get success. At Chesterfield and Partick Thistle, you're obviously, I'm going in new to the club and didn't really at any point get control of, of that history, that understanding. I always, at any club I've ever been at, stand up for the club and try and follow the values of the club. Every club has different values that you have to, when you go in, you have to immerse yourself in that and you have to be passionate about that. And, and with real pride, wear that club's badge on your chest and, and show off the club as best you can. This is something I tried at Partick Thistle and, and I believe it worked, albeit I didn't have the time to really implement it. But I've put some, some different badges in, up here and everyone, when you see these badges, you associate with these badges different feelings, uh, different levels of you know, success maybe, or different levels of standards uh, throughout these different badges, but you associate different things with them. At Partick Thistle, the badge on the right, I tried to use the thistle and the imagery of the thistle in terms of the, the spikiness. A thistle will never die, it, it is never beaten, and tried to use this, this badge uh, to, to try and create the, the team uh, values and, and behaviours that I wanted. Obviously, like I said, didn't get the time, but using the, the symbol of the, the club or the organisation is, is a big thing to, to get people to, to buy into this. The army, as, as an organisation, does this a lot and tries to really let people know what it stands for in the history. And I think people, if you know anyone or have met anyone within the army, they really show that off in the pride that they have for the army and the pride that they carry themselves. And I think this is big in creating high-performing teams. Learning mindset, always striving to be better. This is sometimes called a growth mindset. Carol Dweck was a scientist who done a study uh, on this about how having this growth mindset, learning mindset, as I call it, and this search for excellence is important in really trying to get better all the time. To do this, you have to accept constructive criticism and you have to be willing to do something about it. So it's always looking for opportunities to learn, always looking for opportunities to develop. Like I said previous, whether you win or lose, then there's, a, there's something that we can do about that. We can learn something from that. We can learn something from winning. What did we do well? How can we improve that little bit, the fine margins? When we lose, quite clearly there's things we can learn. But having that learning mindset throughout the club will give you reasons for success and will give players constant growth towards being better, towards winning more games and to, towards getting more success for the club. Resilient. Be ready to overcome adversity. I think all of us have had adversity at some point in our life and we have to be ready for that. Preparing mentally and physically within your training program is vital. I think it's important you sometimes make players fail within the training environment. You sometimes set challenges that are too big for them so that they have that feeling of failure and then you discuss it and then you give them encouragement and you give them that the mental tools to, to come back from it. I've had, I could have put thousands of pictures up here. Three, I felt three was enough. Uh, but there were moments in my playing career and obviously management career at Chesterfield where I've failed, missed the penalty, scoring on goals, making mistakes, obviously getting sacked in management. But in any negative, with the right mindset, you can find a positive within that. And when you find that or you have that mindset, 
then that can give you the strength to improve and to come back even stronger. It's not easy, it's a difficult thing, but it can be done. Self-awareness is something, as, as a player, I didn't really realise was, was a resilient thing and being aware of your feelings and speaking to people. But as I've become a manager, this is vital that you have people and players within your organisation that are aware of feelings, are aware of when they do make mistakes, that they need to speak. They need to understand the process of what went wrong. How can we improve? How can we get better? And they need help from staff, from players. Like I said at the beginning, the empathy that players need to show to each other to help people come back from difficult situations and, and tough moments within their career. Taking risks. This is something that all great people, great companies, great teams, are willing to do. You have to first of all be willing to play your way, our way. So whatever style of football you have, whatever way you want to run your organisation, you have to be brave with that. And at times you have to take the risks and you have to be willing to lose in search of gaining victory. So for instance, given your players that, that empowering your players to, to recognize when the time is right to do this is, is vital. I had a captain here, Craig Morgan at, at Wigan, who never went up for corners, always stayed back for corners. And we played a game against Gillingham. It was just, just about halfway through the season. It was a big game. They were up the top. We were up the top of the league. And in the 96th minute, it was 2-2 within the game. And Craig Morgan decided to go up for a corner that he normally wouldn't have, and scored a magnificent header to win the game 3-2. Giving people that uh, power to, to make those decisions, to take those risks, I think is vital. How do you do that again? It's important the ownership that you've gave them and you give them this courage to make those decisions. So you're not, again, a dictator who tells people what to do and they must do this, they must do that. You have to coach and lead in a way that empowers people, that they make those decisions. Will it always work? No. If it doesn't work, we have the, the coping mechanisms throughout the behaviours of, of, our, of our team to then grow from it, to come back from it. But at big moments in games in life, you have to be willing to take risks. And when you do, that is when you achieve great things. Honesty. Living the values and having the actions are much more important than words. As I said at the start, you've seen all the words. You've, you've heard them a thousand times probably and you, you understand what they mean, what they stand for. But the actions and being honest with yourself and each other as a team will make these a reality and will make winning and make success of teams uh, become a reality. So this is, for me, one of the most important ones in a sense that if you don't have that honesty, if you don't uh, look at each other and hold each other accountable for all of these, then they don't mean enough. So they have to mean something and you have to live them out. Your true character will show when nobody is watching. This mirror talk is vital in having this honesty with yourself, but then allowing that to show in the team environment. So what do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see, you know, the lion or do you see the, 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 the cat? And can you then, you know, be honest in that situation that you're, you're willing to really give yourself self-talk and come back to, to the team environment and, and give it everything we've just spoke about to, to help the team uh, get success? It's, it's, all of them are really interconnected, as you can see. All of them kind of flow into one another. And it's vital that, like I said at the beginning, no one is important than the other. They all uh, come into the, the environment that, that you want to create of a high-performing team that is successful, but not only that, that is you know, valued and, and looked upon uh, as, as an organisation that, that can kind of achieve things and, and develop uh, even more and grow even more. That's it for, for me. If, if anyone does have any questions or that, Sean, then I'm, I'm happy uh, to, to, 
to answer them or to, to discuss them. Great, thanks, today. Gary. I've got some questions here coming on, um, so I can read those across to you, and um, and so we can get some more coming in as we go. Does it sound good? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so the first one comes from Niall, and uh, this is one of the ones that actually, when we had Steve McLaren on, he made a point about the Maverick as well. Um, obviously, I think he maybe saw the same picture you saw in, in Alex Ferguson's office. <laughs> um, the Maverick point is a good one. If I could ask a question. Have you got any examples of strategies you might have seen or used to engage a maverick type player into a group of players? Uh, I think for me, the big I've had a few mavericks uh, in, my, in my short time as a, as a manager. The, the biggest thing for me is the maverick has to perform. If the maverick isn't performing, then the little bits of leeway that you have to give them becomes a problem in the team environment. So as a coach or a leader, it's vital that you assess the situation of, of how the Mavericks performing and then you then decide, you know, what, what you give in terms of leeway to, towards that Maverick to to allow him to do what he does and, and ultimately win you games. I think in a team environment when the Maverick is, is winning games for you, everyone accepts him. As soon as he stops doing that, then it then it can become a problem. Uh, so it's 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 again it's it's difficult to give a, a straight answer on that because all of this is a judgment call I think on on dealing with Maverick and you have to assess what is going on at that time and how you deal with certain situations uh, with, with Maverick players. From that perspective, how did you I guess navigate it as a player? Did you see it differently as a player um, when you had that kind of player in your dressing room to how you see it now and how you have to manage the situation as a coach and manager? That's a great question, and and that's totally different. Uh, and as a player, I was all or nothing. You you had to do the same as everyone. You had to give the same as everyone. Uh, and not to name names, but I, we had a player at Wigan who who ultimately won games for us, but at times was lazy. At times didn't do what I felt he could have done for the team, and at that that used to kind of eat me up, and I used to kind of have. Kind of a bit be at loggerheads with him because of that. Now as a manager, I can see, you know, how that that player can win you games and how the management of that player is vital in terms of integrating them within the team environment and making them feel a part of the team environment, but allowing them that individuality to to go and do his stuff to win games. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really difficult thing because your viewpoint completely changes when you become a coach as a, a player, um, being a very different managerial aspect, even as a captain, um, I guess. You've had probably some experience of this, but how do you deal with players, particularly senior players, when reducing their role in the squad? Um, if you have a senior player for underpass managers in a regular, still sees himself as that, but you have to come in and, and change that. How, how do you handle that transition? Again, very difficult. Uh, I think it's some. I think senior players, you have to, you know, you have to embrace them. You have to see, you know, what level they're at. I think I've I've been that player that at Wigan I was the captain. I played every game, and then with injuries, I started kind of dropping out the team or getting subbed. And then you can feel that your influence as a player is is diminishing. Is is not going to be the same. When that happens, my influence as a person never changed. If anything, it, it probably went up a level because I felt like I wasn't influencing on the on the pitch as, as much as I could have. So, I think as long as the the individual that you're dealing with understands that yes, his influence on the pitch might be less, but his influence as a person and as a character around the football club has to be at a hundred percent. If that changes, then that's when, when the problems come. But as long as they're influenced in a different way, then I think older players are, are vital uh, within a team environment. And um, a question from Josh. How would you maximise the opportunity 
to develop these behaviours when training or classroom time is limited. I guess perfect for this kind of time of year when time at the moment when people are having difficulty connecting on a face to face aspect. Well, it's very difficult. Uh, I think what you can do is kind of use different things. I mean, The Last Dance was, was an amazing documentary of, of a team. You know, you can maybe give them episodes of that to watch, to discuss, uh, give players books to read. Uh, to to, to kind of gain some knowledge of, of what you're you know trying to instill in them books like kind of legacy comes to the, the top of my head the All Blacks book where you know the, there is little things within those books within those documentaries that players can pick up and you can discuss them maybe as a group uh, on Zoom calls or when you get back together uh, when, when I am with with the group. Uh, like I said, I'm a big believer in storytelling. I'm a big believer in taking them away from the environment that, of, of a training pitch on going in army days and, and different things. To see people in different uh, situations allows you to see more of their character and allows you to see you know, who is who's buying into these values and who isn't buying into these values. Uh, to to kind of make those decisions quicker, you have to do different things uh, to allow you to see them quicker. And um, on that standpoint, uh, Tyler's asked, from your coach's point of view, is there a way to implement these more specifically with younger players who are just coming into the group? I guess, especially bearing in mind the difference now between younger players coming in and players who were probably, you know, 5, 10, even, even just 15 years ago. Yeah, I, th I think it's easier, to be honest. I think these are pretty modern uh, behaviours in terms of uh, leadership. Uh, like I said, the, the, the days of a dictator for me are gone, where you tell somebody to do something and he does it. If he doesn't do it, you shout at him. That, that is gone from football. It has gone from any walk of life. You aren't going to get the best out of people now if that's how you approach uh, leadership. Uh, so for me, younger players coming into this, this type of uh, environment uh, would thrive because they should already be up to speed with analysis. They should be up to speed uh, with kind of learning mindset and willing to improve and, and going through all the, the processes that we have here to, to get better. When you go into a new club, do you take a certain amount of responsibility into ensuring that those behaviours filter from the first team through the academy process to ensure that when players do come into the first team environment that there, it doesn't take them by surprise. There's a certain level of consistency into the approach. Yeah, without a doubt. I think you have to, when you, when you take over a club, you have to try and, you know, not just infiltrate the academy, you have to kind of try and go through the whole football club uh, up and down, so through the board. You have to try and get, get well, to get the job, you have to, you have to be similar in your views anyway, uh, but then you have to get everyone to buy into this uh, process. If if they don't, then then that's when it becomes a problem. And that's when I said even about you know adhere to the culture of the club. You have to when you're going into a football club, you have to fit. It has to fit perfectly. You have to the supporters, the board, the manager, the players. There has to be a togetherness within all of that, and everyone has to buy into what is happening. If it doesn't, and any any cog isn't working properly then it becomes very difficult to, to succeed. Ultimately, again, results drive everything in terms of you know, what people feel about you. So that helps. If you can win, then that helps you to, to buy you time to allow you to, to implement this. But uh, if results aren't going, you, you have to try and get it some other way uh, so that you get enough time to, to implement this. Because this doesn't just happen. You don't just show this and it, and it happens. In fact, the players wouldn't see that anyway. You just drip feed it into them. But uh, it takes time to, to get these uh, behaviours over to players and for it to happen naturally. From the perspective, I guess, of both player and coach, um, is there a challenge when coming into a role, I guess, in that respect, when there's already a, an existing, I guess, paradigm within the organisation and you're coming in to try and change something, but results are kind of a paramount importance. Um, is, is, have you seen that as, as both a player, I guess, and a coach when organisations have made changes? 
Yeah, I think it's very difficult. That's the biggest challenge. And uh, looking at the two kind of jobs I went into, uh, Chesterfield, uh, I was too quick in trying to change things. Th- thought I could kind of turn water into wine and, and thought I could implement style of play and implement all these things really quickly whilst in a relegation fight. And that was a mistake uh, in hindsight because, like I said, it takes time. So when you first go into a club, you need to get quick wins. You need to get uh, little things across that is going to allow you to win games that then allows confidence and allows you time to to implement uh, your style of play and and your behaviours that that you want to put over to the team. In, I guess, looking back into that situation specifically, if you were to go back into that again, um, what would be the one thing that you would really focus on correcting or, I guess, changing as you first went in rather than trying to change too much if you had one of the specific behaviours um, that you wanted to try and instill immediately? Which, which one would you kind of begin with rather than trying to kind of fit it all in quickly? Uh, I'd try and make players feel more comfortable. Uh, so I'd try, and, I'd, I'd try and make the team more cohesive in a sense that put, put kind of round pegs and round holes, make people feel comfortable in, in the role that they're doing within the team. Uh, I think the biggest thing I probably didn't do at any club uh, was was individual chats. I, I would try and get to know the individual more uh, and quicker so that I understood uh, him better as an individual. I think I've focused, at all the jobs I've been at, I've focused too much on the team, and that might sound a bit contradictory in a sense that the team is the big thing, but understanding the individuals within the team is vital uh, to, to put them in the right position for them to thrive and to, to do well. And, um, I was recently listening to a podcast that Dan Abrams did with Damien Hughes, and he um, had explored the culture that had been developed at Barcelona. And one of the things that he talked about a lot was the cultural architects and the cultural assassins in a group. Um, and I guess that comes back to leaders, really. Do you specifically determine leaders within a group and you know, use them to get across the message? And again, if you have guys who are counter to that culture that you're trying to create, how do you deal with that situation? Yeah, well, energizers and energy sappers, you know, you, you see it in every walk of life. You know, people come in a building and the energy in the room increases. People come in a building and the energy drops. And you want to uh, empower and, and give uh, the leadership role to as the energizers as much as you possibly can. Because with them driving the, the team, then that is the, the best way forward to, to get that success. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. In terms of one of the aspects that um, in the 11 principles, obviously there are, I guess, connectors. Um, how do you see communication and have you seen the team that communicates well within themselves without, I guess, your direct input being more successful than one that has to be continuously, you know, cajoled for every little hole and stuff? Yeah, I think, I think within that, yeah, there isn't a kind of communication, but I think all of them, running through all of them, communication is there in a sense that you're giving ownership to players, you're empowering players, you're focusing on the process and it's constantly a two-way thing and again that was at Wigan that that happened throughout the season probably kind of just before Christmas probably took me about five months uh, at Wigan and that, that, that clicked into place where team meetings became two-way you know players talking to players within the meeting, players discussing with me within the meeting, uh, never disrespectful, never uh, in a way where you were trying to kind of go over the top of someone. It was always in a way that, how can we improve here? We're, we're trying to improve, and it was a collective thing. At the other clubs, Chesterfield and Partick Thistle, struggled to get that, that kind of two-way feedback. Both groups of players were uh, reluctant to, to say things, uh, I got it a little bit at Thistle near the end of uh, uh, the first season I was there with, with an experienced group of players, a good experienced group of players that it became uh, better. Uh, but Wigan was the only place where I really felt that communication was, you know, two ways, went right uh, through the staff, through the players. And then when they got on the park, that team was 
the best team that you could just leave them once they got in the park because you had that communication during the week and training and meeting rooms. Once they got in the park, it was very, very uh, little that I had to then say to them. It was at half time again, little bits of information, uh, and they they almost kind of took it upon themselves. In those situations where you mentioned that it's just a game building, so you weren't getting that as a back and forth. If you were there in the long term, is that one of the things you would then kind of focus in terms of your recruitment? Players who are maybe more engaged, is that part of the process? You know, recruit for character rather than for talent at that level to try and build that culture that, that you would be looking for? Without a doubt, yeah. My, the recruitment at, at Chesterfield was, was really poor. Uh, again, mistakes made. Uh, but at Partick Thistle, the recruitment was excellent in January. And, and the biggest thing we spoke about as a club was, was character. We recruited good characters. We recruited people who we knew or knew of that, that, that came with high recommendations of character. And yes, they were good players, uh, but the character was a big emphasis. And we signed, I think it was five players who were over 30-year-old uh, who, who knew me and knew, knew the assistant manager. And, and can I, that, that worked really well. So in recruitment, character over talent any day of the week. Dimitri has asked a question and he's asked specifically about Roberto Martinez, but I think you can open it up to all of the managers you've worked under. Um, he said, what did you learn from Martin, Roberto Martinez while playing under his management? And is it something that you've used later when you become a manager yourself? Um, so I guess, again, open up to any of the managers you've worked with. You, you mentioned Gordon Strachan, but any of the ones where you've taken specific things from? Yeah, Roberto, for me, the two big things that, that he has that are, that are brilliant are positivity. He is the most positive man. Uh, when I said find a, a, a negative, a uh, positive and any negative, I should have actually mentioned Roberto because we would be bottom of the league and, and losing games and, and he could still give us something that on Monday morning we could come in and, and be enthusiastic and positive about working on the next week. So fantastic positivity and, and a fantastic tactician, really obsessed with football and, and understands the game inside out. Uh, Gordon Strachan was somebody that he, he kind of managed almost more from the heart and, and he kind of uh, he used to he, ha he had three or four players who he used to could, could have a go at I was one of them so at half time he would kind of he would go he would go into you he would, he would tell you exactly what he thought and it was you know it was pretty harsh at times but then at the end of the game he had this brilliant ability of just patting you on the shoulder and it made you feel you know 10 foot tall and, and that kind of pat on the back was was such a big thing when you got it it made you kind of want to do well for him and want to do more. So he was more, a, I would say, an emotional uh, coach, a very good tactician as well, but somebody that, that kind of just got you with, with what he said and you wanted to, to run through a brick wall for him. You think um, you mentioned he only really got on top of three of the players. Do you think that had a lot to do with him being very aware of players and how they would respond to it. He would know players that would not respond well to that kind of treatment and would go into their shell compared to players who would motivate them to, to improve and to perform. Well, without a doubt, absolutely. I think he, he, he didn't do it, you know, well, sorry, he done it deliberately uh, to, to impact the team. He picked on certain people that he felt would impact the team. Uh, like we said, the Mavericks, I made the mistake once at Wigan uh, after a game you know, the Maverick didn't do what I, I had asked him to do and I was annoyed with it and, and let my kind of frustrations boil over and had a go at him in front of the team. Then when I spoke to him individually, he didn't like that. You know, the Maverick didn't like that situation. Uh, I obviously apologised and, and kind of patched things up with him and uh, we were fine. But that was a lesson that, you know, having a go at the Maverick, you know, in front of other people, uh, can sometimes have a detrimental effect. So without doubt, Gordon Strachan knew exactly what he was doing uh, when he was doing those things. It was all premeditated. And a question from Simon. After winning promotion, how important is it to keep the players' feet on the floor for the following season? Or is it about changing personnel to 
I guess, freshen the hunger up, but also to ensure that you've got the right players for the level that you're going into? Uh, I think the, the mistake I made at, at, at Wigan was probably changing too much too quickly. Looking back, uh, we had a fantastic season, a real good core group of players. I felt we needed to add uh, quality to the group, which we did, to be fair. We signed uh, Dan Byrne and Nick Powell. Uh, can I remember? We signed more, but they were they were two really good signings, quality players who who have played championship and, and beyond. Uh, but that kind of broke up the, the team spirit that we had created the previous season. So uh, it's it's a fine line between putting more quality in the team and and uh, disturbing the the group and the, the spirit that you've created the previous season. I look at like Sheffield United as they've went through the leagues. They didn't make massive changes as they went through the leagues, and that has has gave them the the, the team spirit that is is kind of at the forefront of their their success uh, and what is is helping them do so well now. So it's it's a fine line between uh, signing too many and, and signing too little. As you go into the, the higher division, does the financial aspect of it become more of a, a point in the dressing room? You mentioned you sign players of higher quality. Does the financial aspect of what they're being paid impact on the players who were with you previously or maybe aren't paid as much and it becomes a issue that you have to kind of deal with in the dressing room at that point? Yeah, without a doubt, it's another issue that you need to manage and, and again, you need to go back to the behaviours and, and you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it to make the team better. You're doing it to uh, try and improve. Uh, so it's a real challenge, again, that, that players who've done well for you you know, feel like you, you they owed something from you, but you try you're trying to improve the squad, improve the team. Uh, so it's a real challenge of of getting that mix right and and making sure that you know you don't you know give too much money to to other players and and disrupt the harmony within the the dressing room. And for those players that have come with you on this journey, but maybe lack the sufficient quality at the next level up, um, kind of like I guess phasing out the older players, um. How do, you, how do you manage that situation if it's a player who did great in the lower division but maybe doesn't have the, the qualities to perform at a high level in the next division up? How do, how do you manage that situation with them? Again, you just have to be honest, I think. You know, honesty is, is, is massive for me in management. I've never been one to, to tell somebody something just to keep them on side. I, I try and be honest with players and, and tell them exactly what I think. Uh, so being honest with people, if... They're not going to be a part of it in terms of on the pitch. Are they still giving you something off the pitch? Uh, so being honest with people and, and letting them know the role and exactly what you're looking for from them, can they, can they do that? It's, again, a two-way thing. Because if you're asking somebody to maybe play less but still give a lot to the team environment and they're not willing to do that, they want to play more, they have to be honest with you. So it's a, it's a two-way thing. And as long as you're honest with players, I don't think you go far wrong. No, I think honesty, um, like you mentioned, honesty is a huge part of being a coach and getting people to buy into these behaviours that we're talking about, trying to cultivate a better culture. Um, as soon as you're honest with, with players and with your staff, um, that very quickly falls apart. Yeah, From the highs of promotion to, to the lows of relegation, Dylan has asked, can you uh, just feel how vital in your individual development was the relegation? Um, and how did you attempt to motivate the team when it was struggling? based on you know, the development of behaviours and the cultures that you discussed? Yeah, it's very difficult uh, being you know, involved in a team that's losing. Uh, and, and we lost a lot of games. We, we were poor. Uh, that's when the resilience comes in. You know, you need to... As a, as a player, uh, losses affect you. As a manager, it's, it's much tougher, I think. The Saturday night, the Sunday, you're really low. Uh, but I think over the years as a player, I've developed this kind of thick skin, this resilience that always on the Monday morning, I was ready. Uh, I'd kind of let, let it go. I'd figured it out in my head and I was ready to come back again on the Monday morning and, and back to process focus. You know, the, the, the game's gone. We can't get Saturday back. What is the process from Monday to Friday to make sure that we try and win the game the following Saturday. And that is what I've always tried to do as a player and as a manager.
one of the questions that um, Jamie's asked, you mentioned your parents as being a really good grounding point for the development of values. Um, but obviously you had a, a brother as well who has also moved into playing professionally. How did that impact you in terms of developing the core values and, and I guess competitiveness and resilience as you were growing up to be able to prepare yourself for both professional football as a player and as a manager? Yeah, I think I was very lucky that I had a brother uh, who played football as well. I've, I've said this numerous times. Uh, he set the benchmark and, and then I had something to aim at. And I think it's always easier in life if, if you've got something to aim at, if you've got a time to aim at when you go on a run, if you've got, you know, when he played for Scotland Schoolboys, I had to do that. When, when he got in Newcastle's team, I tried to do that. I didn't, but it, it's having something to aim at and, and kind of follow is far easier than, than setting the trail. So I was very lucky that my brother, you know, was in football with me and had a fantastic career as well. Uh, but my mum and dad taught us both, I think, brilliant values. And I think work ethic would be the first, you know, they, they both... My mum and dad worked extremely hard their whole life to, to give us what we had and my wee sister. Uh, and that has definitely passed on to us. Yeah. Soccer starts at home is something that's big being promoted over here at the moment to try and build a culture in the US of players being not just learning to touch a ball to develop that culture of soccer, but in terms of, like I said, value and instilling of these cultural and core values. Um, I think for any coach here who works with younger teams especially, that's something that can sometimes be forgotten in terms of the development of players and young people. Um, so it's really great to hear your points on it, Gary, and how it can be formed at home as well. Um, it's very important. So Natasia has asked, where did you learn storytelling um, or any books or videos that you recommend that you utilise to help develop that skill set? It's just something I've, I've picked up and, and a lot of courses, of uh, the leadership courses I've been on, I've spoke about storytelling, but I've always been into documentaries. I've read autobiographies, sports and, and others uh, my whole life. So I'm big on trying to, you know, when you're trying to send a message, you know, using imagery, using video, using storytelling is vital. And I've, I've shown players videos before a game of tightrope walkers of you know people who are you know disabled and, and still running marathons and, and doing amazing things to to try and inspire players to try and you know give them something uh, that, that maybe gives them switches something on in their mind that, that gives them that extra one percent so I, I'm really big on it I'm really big on the symbolism as well like I said, I tried it this year at Thistle and, and whilst, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I only got five games into the season. I, I think it worked. I think there's a there's a big thing in it that if you use that badge, whatever it is, and, and try and use that symbol however you want to to kind of get the pride into the players of what they're what and who they're playing for, that, that goes into the supporters as well. Uh, I done that at Partick Thistle before the the last game of the season. One of the supporters made a video before the game of supporters going to games and different things. And uh, I'm a big believer in, in bringing that all together to to get that extra one percent out of people to to help you win games. You mentioned video in terms of that sense of symbolism and, and inspiring videos, but what about videos of performance? Um, how much do you use that to provide positive, negative feedback to open up the conversation about behaviours uh, and goal settings? And is that something that you work extensively in, or or is something to build upon? In terms of uh, motivation, or in terms of analysis? I guess a bit of both. Do you use that analysis to particularly motivate players for someone who's done something really well, or you know when you're trying to balance negative feedback way to motivate them to? I guess, Yeah, as motivation, I think as a team, sparingly, I think if you do it too much, it becomes less impactful. In terms of individuals, if there is a, an individual who maybe lacks confidence, you know, I've, I've made certain individuals I've worked with little videos and, and they've watched them to hopefully, you know, give them a boost of, of confidence before games. Uh, in terms of analysis, I always try and 
even when we lose, I always try and show some positive. So, you know, I'm, I'm never, I'm not big on meetings where everything is criticism, everything is negative. I always try and so, show some positive or uh, try and have a meaning to what I show. It's not a highlights reel. It's, you know, meaningful, it's impactful. It's going to then uh, apply onto the training pitch, which, which will then go into the next game. So, uh I think the best way is to always always try and show something positive, even when you're trying to kind of show a negative point, put in a positive as well, uh, so that players don't get too down on themselves and don't lose confidence. Question from Murray. Um, and I think you can look at this on both sides. As a player, you've had new managers come in. Um, what key behaviours did they show, good and bad? And how quickly were you as a player and as a group of players? to make a, a judgment on that manager on the basis of those behaviours they, they demonstrated very early in their, in their tenure as coach? I think everyone makes judgments on people very, very early. I think the, you know, the actual timing is like seconds. You're, you're making assumptions of people within seconds of seeing them, of meeting them. Uh, but I think managers, you know, players, all players that, that I've been with give, give every manager you know, the respect when they come in. And then it's, you know, it takes time for them either to gain more respect or, or lose that respect and, and then kind of lose lose the dressing room. Uh, so I think as a manager now going into clubs, your first, you know, few weeks at a club are vital in the, the kind of how you approach it, how you come across to the players, how you develop relationships with the players. Uh, because if that doesn't go well, then it's very difficult to turn that around. So those f first few weeks are, are vital in starting to show uh, you as a person and, and you as you know a football man and how you want the game to be played. Dave has asked, when selecting your backroom staff, or I guess assessing the existing staff when you come into a new organisation, do you run through your 11 behaviours with them? Or do you run for your own behaviours when going through that selection process so they can be the, the ones who help you implement it across the playing style? Yeah, I think st staff are vital. Staff have to be not the same as, as the manager, but they have to understand the behaviours. They have to understand the style of play. Uh, and they have to, again, honesty, uh, a, big, a big word that we've used a lot, but they have to be honest with you. So when you ask, well, whenever I ask a question, I want an honest answer. I don't want, you know, the, the, the answer that, that's easy. I want the answer that they believe uh, is best for the team. So I think you need honesty within your staff. That would be the main thing I would look for. And then, you know, we can work through all the other ones and, and get a, a common ground within that. But uh, without honesty, then, then your staff are, are no good to you, really. And when you have your, your staff and your guys are putting together the, the plans for recruitment um, or the, the playing squad going into the, the following season, how involved are they and you in development of finding that character that you're looking for in terms of um, do you make sure you meet the player before you sign them? Do you get like character profiles and references? Because um, obviously there's lots more resources available to people now than maybe again, 10, 15 years ago when you had to just meet the play for dinner and see how they, how they arrive, etc. Yeah, I think it's using the contacts you have within the game to get as many references as you can. I always try and meet the player. I think of the players I've signed, I've always met, I would say about 90% of them I've met before I signed them and had a meal or, or went out and met them at the house. I think that's vital that you get a feel for them, they get a feel for you. Uh, but the, the character references are vital in a, in a sense that you, you phone people you trust and, and get as many uh, bits of information on each player's character as you can. You know, what's he like in training? What does he do away from the place? What type of, you know, has he got family? Uh, what type of person is he? Because, you know, like I said at uh, the beginning, it's character over talent for me when, when you're signing players because uh, you need to bring the right type of people into the, the club. And in terms of when we had the, the behaviours of performing, high performing teams, in terms of drip feeding it in, or do you give players the 
I guess, the autonomy to be part of that process in terms of engaging with you in terms of and how do you manage the expectation of those behaviors and and how they're how they're secured in terms of long-term processes yeah i think you know th these are my beliefs and, and behaviors i think uh, again ownership co-creation i have to work with the players i can't just put this on players because if they don't believe in it they're not going to follow it uh, so I try and get the players to, to do this. At, at Partick Thistle this summer, we, we try to really get the players to buy into it. Again, time didn't really show if it worked or it didn't, but the players were very good in coming together uh, a code of, of values and behaviours that, that they believed they needed uh, to, to go forward. The, the biggest thing we probably didn't do was live the values. We didn't have enough time uh, together to, to make that a reality uh, but the process I think in the beginning was good whether it, it kind of carried through you know I, I, I don't know the answer to that but you can't just put things on players and, and, and tell them they must do it there has to be uh, a bit of two-way uh, process and, and how they, they buy into this and I guess with that in mind in terms of if you have a player who continuously doesn't meet those behavioral standards do you, you know, provide like a feedback loop in terms of this is what's happening, this is what we need to correct? Is it a process of continued re-education? Um, yeah, that kind of uh, process in terms of, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's individual conversations. Again, like, you know, that was probably something I, I would do more of at the next club so that I understand every individual's views on the behaviours because each individual will have a different opinion on it. And looking back at when I'd done it with Partick Thistle, probably giving it to the whole team was, was the wrong thing. You should probably give it to little uh, kind of subgroups within the team to, to create different ones. And that means that I think it becomes more rounded when it's just the whole team. I think it, it's less diluted. It's, it's more probably the leaders are, are running it. So I think more individual, give individuals a voice, we'll, we'll create a better uh, team team behaviours. Perfect. And I feel like the guy on BBC right now with a three-year-old running around behind me. So just try and ignore him if you see him, guys. <laughs> um, but time for one last question. Um, and I think this is a good one to end on because it's going to hopefully help everyone become better. Um, Andrew's asked two questions. Firstly, and this is one of, I think it's a good one. Firstly, what is the best advice that you've been given? Again, I wanted you to share with coaches who are maybe just making their way in the game, um, looking to continue to develop and improve and hopefully coach at, at the highest levels or even just within their environments that they're in at the moment. The best advice, uh, the, the best advice I had from mum and dad, I think we'll get back to was, was you know, if you want something, work hard, uh, and and you will get there. Uh, was was kind of their advice to anything. Give it, give it your best shot. And I say it to my kids all the time: if you're going to do something, do it to the best of your ability. It might not always be good enough, uh, but then you then analyse it and and you you move on to the next thing and try and make that better. So, uh, I think that's great advice in terms of management. I think I hear it all the time, and again, I, I, kinda, I don't have it in the, the behaviours, but winning the next game is so important in buying you time to allow you to implement your uh, behaviours, your style of play, uh, how you want to be as a coach, as a manager. And so many managers, I remember I went to Brendan Rodgers at Celtic, and he said, just win the next game. That, that is your focus as the manager whilst also building all these little blocks of style of play, the behaviours you want in the club. Uh, but winning the next game is so important to buy you time. Uh, and, and he is right in that. With that in mind, um, so how, how often and how much do you formally self-reflect on the basis of both performances in, in games and, and in training? And do you give, have your players... I guess give you direct feedback or reflection or is that something you rely on the staff for more than the players? In terms of what? In terms of how you analyse it? 
yeah, how you would uh, look back on a game in terms of, I guess, your decision making as part of that process and in terms of the training. Sometimes it doesn't go as well as you hope it's going to go. Just reflecting on that after being great, and you want to reflect on hows and whys and the outcomes from that process. You know, it's every day. I think it's every day. It's a, you know, it's a daily thing. After training, you'll discuss how the training went. The next morning, you'll be discussing yesterday how you plan forward. After every game, you you watch it back probably more than once. You're then taking bits out for the game. So. I think self-reflection, analysis, review of what you've done is massive in, in coaching and development as well. You know, you, I think we all plan sessions really well and I think we all can carry it out really well. The, the review stage is, is for me the most important that you analyse that honestly uh, and then you look back at the good and the bad and, and then you try and improve it. The same with games, you look back at the game the good and the bad, and you try and improve it. And that is the only way to learn and, and get better. Yep, I 100% agree with that. And I think for coaches working in the youth environment, it's super valuable to find a way to be able to analyse it. Not everyone has the resources of their professional clubs. So finding a way to video your own sessions and just watch them back and video your games and watch them back and be able to just, just to reflect on that as an individual in terms of what you did, how you acted is really important. Um, yeah, that was my question. Done. I've got a second question from Andrew. Sorry. Working with players that have lost confidence, um, what advice do you have in managing them, supporting them through that process, and any key elements that you would use to support that process? Again, I think it's just being positive with them. Uh, I, I had a player who, who, had, who had great ability. Uh, great physical attributes and, and was, was so hard on himself, was going on Twitter, was reading feedback. And, and you know, the modern world uh, with the, that we live in with social media, for players now is really difficult. And they can lose, if they go on stuff like that and, and read everything, then, then it's no surprise that they can lose confidence. So trying to keep people off stuff like that and keep people focused on what is important in terms of the, the behaviours, in terms of the process that you, you go through during the week, uh, in terms of listening to important people, the manager, the coaches, uh, people within the club, uh, is vital. So it's, it's been there for people and, and understanding that, you know, football's not easy. Everyone loses form, everyone can lose confidence uh, and you have to be there for people at that moment. Uh, almost kind of build them back up again gradually and then allow them to, to go out and flourish. And it might just take one shot, one cross, one goal for, for that to turn. But uh, within that process, when they have lost it, you, you have to be there for them and talk and, and communicate uh, how they're feeling, what, what they're going through, uh, and, and then give them coping mechanisms psychologically, but also give them... Uh, stuff on the pitch that is going to repetition on the pitch that's going to give them that that kind of uh the technical bit of it back uh, to allow them to go and perform i will thank you so much for your time today gary went through was really valuable the feedback already from the, from the attendees has been great um, I found this to be super interesting and, and I'm going to take a lot from it personally and I hope all of you guys who joined us will as well. So to Gary, thank you so much again for your time today. Um, again, this is super valuable to all of us. So super appreciative that you were able to spend the time to do so. Thanks very much, Sean, for inviting me. I really enjoyed it and I hope the people listening did too. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. And thank you, Gary. And so long. Stay safe. Thank you.